Shalom Chavim. It's great to get to spend a few minutes here with you. Uh, be kind of a short video. I, I, I wanted to talk to you real quick about some questions that are being asked me by quite a few of you. And seeing as these are some uh, repeat questions, I figured I would just quickly address some of these. A lot of things that are on people's heart. One, uh, and these won't be word for word because I'm taking it from different people's questions, but the question keeps getting asked me a lot about the 144,000. And uh, kind of coupled with that is where I speak about uh, scripturally, the, the question I've been asked scripturally, how could I say that when God actually um, uh, remo would say remove the bride, if that would be the case, removes his bride and then turns to the Jews, scripturally, how would I uh, prove that there, that there would not be another soul saved at that point? Uh, so let's look at both those questions there. The 144,000, here's what's interesting. The question was asked me, that there are, are actually posed to me that uh, more maybe of a statement that the person believed that this could actually be maybe the five foolish virgins. And that brings in a, a lot of interesting things. I was actually talking to a brother, uh, Michael, or Matthew, Brother Matthew from uh, Punta Gorda this morning. And uh, we were talking about this very subject, and right while we were talking, the Lord revealed to me something I had never known about the foolish virgins. Fascinating revelation here. But anyway, here's how you know it's not the five foolish virgins, because the one statement Jesus makes is, I don't know you to the five foolish virgins. Now, uh, the 144,000 he knows, because even uh, John recognizes who they are, what tribe they belong to, and, but the foolish virgins here, he does not know. And, the, the, and, and it's kind of interesting if you think about it in this light here. Here Christ is, he knows everything. He has the mind of God. He can foretell the future. He knows the past. Uh, there's, as, as even Brother Matthew put it out, you know, he knows the number of your, the hairs on your head. Uh, a lot of things about that as well. So how could he sit here and say, I don't know you? Now, he didn't say, I never knew you. He says, I don't know you. And, uh, and I have always held that that five foolish virgins are actually the Christian people that have believed that Jesus is Messiah. They've embraced it. In other words, they've taken him as their savior, but they miss that rapture and they go into tribulation and they are the ones that actually give their lives for the very gospel that they believe. Kind of like uh, Peter, you know, when Jesus says to Peter, the way that you would not, that way you will go. Uh, in other words, he was signifying to Peter, Peter said that he would die with Jesus uh, rather than him having to die alone. But when it came down to it, he showed his color. Uh, not that Peter wasn't a godly man, he was. But uh, he denied Jesus three times, and then later in his life, in his death, he was crucified just as Jesus was, but Peter, not being worthy, he said, to be crucified such as his Savior, was hung upside down on the cross. Uh, so, but why though would God say, I don't know you? Well, interestingly enough, in the Hebrew language, we use the same terminology like English does. Remember the statement where uh, the scripture says uh, to Adam in the, in the Torah, um, um, and he knew his wife. I think I'm just kind of paraphrasing that right off, you know, uh, you know, where Adam and Eve actually had relations together. Now, English uses a nice way of putting it, and he knew her. Okay, Hebrew uses the exact same terminology, okay? Um, and he knew her would be, uh, 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 excuse me, Yodeahu, uh, or Yodeah, uh, and he knew his, let's use it, and he knew his wife, Ve Yodeah Ishto, and he knew his wife. See, it's the word Yodea means knew or know, to know someone, in an intimate setting, I want to say, to an intimate setting, he knows her intimately. And so we use that same terminology, and he knew her. So it's interesting that Jesus makes this comment here in the five foolish virgins there, I don't know you. See, in other words, the relationship between Yeshua and the ones that are claiming to be his is never consummated. The marriage is not consummated with the sealing of the Holy Ghost. So even though they are virgins, virgin shows that they are clean, they're not defiled, they're not 
ungodly people, but they come up with the five that are ready to go in a resurrection, or a rapture in this case here. They're ready to go in the rapture. These he does know because why? They, they're, they're, they've been sealed with the Holy Ghost. And what's funny, though, is the oil is represents, in Hebrew, oil it represents spirit. It's the Spirit of God, the Ruach HaKadosh. So the five foolish, they don't have what they need to go. But yet they believed on Jesus. They accepted Him as their Savior. They're, they're virgins. They're clean. See? But yet with Israel, the 144,000, the Bible says they're sealed. And it's funny because even in the Tanakh, and I can't recall where the passage is, but God says, you will no longer call me Bali. But you will call me Ishi. See, Bali literally means my husband, but Ishi, the word Ish, which is what Adam was called in the beginning, is a compound meaning from the word of fire and Yahweh. And he says, You will call me my Ishi, in other words, my, in other words, my fire of God. They received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And Israel has given the Holy Ghost all of them at one time the same day. Why? Which answers the second question that a lot of people are asking me, they say, Steve, you, you say that when the 144,000 are sealed, the bride goes up, there's not another soul saved during tribulation. What scriptural basis do you have for this? It's because Jesus, who sits, Yeshua, sits at the right hand of God, he's making intercession upon your confession, he's sitting on the mercy seat. But when he rises up out of that mercy seat, who is there to make intercession upon your confession? See, the Bible says that they behold him in the air. In fact, there's a lot of, I, I, I don't know if you've ever asked, anybody's ever asked this question, but there's been a lot of question worldwide about the seventh seal. It says in the seventh seal, there's silence in heaven for about the space of a half an hour. And nobody seems to know what it is. It's written right there in the Tanakh what it is. It says in the Tanakh, it says, He has risen up, it says, Let everything keep silent, for He has risen up out of His holy habitation. So the seventh seal is when the rapture happens because God is raising up out of His seat to come and redeem His bride from off the earth. And at the same time, before He does that, He has to seal the 144,000 with the Holy Ghost. Because why? He is raising up out of his habitation. There's no one to make intercession upon your confession any longer. How is someone going to get saved? You see, that's where it comes in. You, you can't get saved if there's no, if there's no, there's no longer the blood is gone. The one that intercedes for you is now left that seat, the meditorial seat. Satan is kicked out. He's put on the earth three and a half years. He goes into a rampage. So they give it with their own life but they don't lose their salvation. But that's why Jesus says, I don't know you. In other words, he never consummated the marriage that you started with him. You got engaged with him, but you never consummated it by letting him fill you with the Holy Ghost. That's what he means with the intimacy. You've never fell in love with him till he's taking you into his room and he has confirmed his love to you by giving you the Holy Ghost. Wow, okay, souls under the altar. That's another wonderful one here. Uh, a lot of people say that they believe that the souls under the altar are the Christian martyrs. Well, here's what, here's how you know. Little tidbits that you see that I can show you that God has revealed to me that, that you may not think about. This is why we know they have to be Jews. The Jews are still under the law. Now, Stephen was the first Christian martyr. And just as Jesus, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Stephen does the same thing. Father, they don't know what they're doing. So he asked for mercy for them. So how could his, you, do we think that his testimony would change now that he is now in the presence of God? Now he's crying out, God, how long until you avenge my blood? You know, if he's crying out for mercy for their souls, why would he cry out for vengeance? See, it doesn't make sense. But the Jews, on the other hand, still believe in an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's what Moses commanded. So therefore, he does cry out for blood. Whereas a Christian, the true Christians, they never would do that. They never would do that. So, all right, souls under the altar, that should take care of that one there. Um, six, the sixth seal, that's another one that I get questions about a little bit here and there, is the sixth seal 
about uh, some people believe that's the rapture. Well, if you notice in the sixth seal of Revelation, it's an interruption of nature. So what type of, what causes a major interruption of nature such as the one we see in the sixth seal? Well, if we think when Moshe or Moses, when Moses was on the earth and Pharaoh, everything was seemed to be going great in, in, in their life. They have this nice slave labor, all that's going great for Pharaoh. And all of a sudden Moses comes down with Aaron, two witnesses, if you might call it here. He comes down and Moses brings a complete interruption of nature. And if Moses brought that interruption of nature, and we know that Elijah or the two witnesses of Revelation are to come as well, and we already see that they have the gifts of Elijah's ministry and as well as Moses turning the water to blood, uh, bringing down fire out of uh, heaven, uh, things of this nature here, they come to interrupt nature. So I, I kind of lean towards more the two witnesses actually are the sixth seal being fulfilled in their ministry. And of course, it's interesting because the seventh seal hasn't taken place at that point. And that's another reason why it's looking more and more. You know, people call it mid-trib. I do believe in a rapture before the tribulation. But you, we got to quit lumping Daniel's 70th week as all the tribulation. I don't, I don't see that. It's, Daniel's 70th week applies to Israel. So it doesn't mean that it's all tribulation. But in Revelation, though, we do see a three-and-a-half-year tribulation where Satan is turned loose. That, that's your tribulation. Now, still, could he take us out? Could he take that bride out before the seven year begins? There, there's a possibility. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, anyway, uh, two other things here. One is going to, I want to talk to you just quickly about Abigail. And the reason why I say that, there is a brother that left me a note on there. And I think I know who this brother is. There is a doctor um, that about a year ago, I did a, a video called Obama Has Touched God's Anointed. If you haven't seen that video, I encourage you to watch it. It'll, it'll shock you. It's something that God revealed to me when Obama had, had took and snubbed, uh, back in 2010, he snubbed Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in, at the meeting there and refused, uh, basically he just refused uh, to, to let, he didn't even invite him to dinner, so to speak. And when I saw that, I recognized that uh, he was repeating history with David when David had requested of Nabal uh, food and provision after he had protected him so long and let nothing, no harm come of his, of his things. Uh, he, re he sent a messenger and requested help. Instead of getting the help, he got snubbed. Nabal, which in Hebrew means a fool, was having a big party and did not invite David, did not send him any provisions, just totally ignored him and said, who is this King David? Who Everybody thinks he's a king. Kind of just put him down and everything. And then uh, and when David got word back about this, David was going to kill him. He armed his men. And the point that I'd seen that God had showed me, just kind of briefly watch the video. It would really help you, I believe. It would bless your heart. Uh, Obama has cut, touched God's anointed is the name of that video. But he armed his men, showing that God would have destroyed this nation when Obama treated Benjamin Netanyahu the way he did. Now, there's a lot of people who say, well, he's just a secular king. He's this, he's that, and everything. Let me tell you something. Mike Evans anointed that man and prophesied over him that you will be prime minister not once, but twice over Israel. Poured the oil on his head. Had no idea who Benjamin Netanyahu was or anything at the time. Um, and, of course, we've seen it come to pass. So, like Saul... Saul did a lot of things wrong, but he was still God's anointed. David even testifies of that. Uh, so we look at this situation, though, and we realize what God would have done. Abigail, though, and this is when the Holy Spirit revealed to me that Abigail is a type of the true Christian that interceded on behalf of Nabal, that God would have mercy and she says, is he not rightly named Nabal, a fool? Is he not named, rightly named uh, a fool? And brings a beautiful, uh, just, just brought all the, the figs and, and grapes and all the food. She brings a gift and lays it at his feet and to, to, to ask for forgiveness for her husband's actions. Uh, but anyway, um, th this brother, he had mentioned to me, and, and if I'm not mistaken, this same brother, who, if, if it's the same guy, he, he's a doctor in South Florida here somewhere, when he saw the video, 
he was actually helming his church. I don't know what church he's affiliated with. They were in Israel. They had been given an invitation before the Knesset in Israel. And he takes this very story that God had uh, revealed to me and and shared it before the Knesset, that they wanted to be the Abigail of today. They wanted to be, because I actually talk about Michelle Bachman and how that Michelle Bachman went before and, and asked Obama to apologize for what he'd done, and he refused to do that. And so they got together, her and several of the senators and congressmen, and did the apology to Israel on his behalf. And I believe that's one reason why God spared. Now remember, though, Nabal does die, though, uh, 10 days later. I've always wondered, is there a spiritual connection with that? Is that possibly that 10 years later, 2020, could it be that that's when God will destroy this country for that? Uh, remember, Obama is only playing a part. He's not, you know, it's important. It's important on that. But anyway, this brother, though, uh, that wrote me, he started a thing called the Abigail Project or something like that. I forget the actual name. I'll try to find out for you and post it later. But he started this project and was hoping to get on, uh, I guess, national radio because he has some connections there. Uh, they didn't have him on. But uh, I would just encourage you, let's, let me find out who he is and let's try to support uh, that effort. And I'd love to be a part of that if to do it as well and to talk about what can the Christians do. There's many videos I've done about that, about how the, also with the Ruth, if you watch the Ruth series, very interesting series there because it speaks to the Gentiles and what the Gentiles were called of God to do. Uh, very late hour. Anyway, another thing, I, I was asked a question, or actually someone posed a comment to me about, said, I'd love to support this ministry, but financially I don't have that means. What could I do to help? And one thing that come to my mind, because it's not like I need a lot of finances or anything like that, I'm just trying to bless the people and it does cost money to do it. We try to fund it as much as we can, me and my wife. Um, but you know, there is something though that the people could do. And you guys are all YouTubers. That's why you're here. Take a little bit of time, even if you could do it on a regular basis as you visit other videos or even go look for new videos, whether they be Jewish, whether they be Christian, uh, evangelical, or whatever the case may be. Mention what you're hearing here and how God is blessing you with this channel here. Post it on your Facebook. The more people we can get to hear, and it's, I'm not the only guy out there by no means that, that, is, that is trying to bring you the truth. There's many others that are doing it as well. But uh, perhaps it might bless other people. So I just I ask you, just take that time and put out put out comments everywhere you can and tell them, you know, the Ben Danoon, the YouTube channel entitled Ben Danoon, or our website, IsraelReturns.com. I don't post as many things on there as I should, but uh, YouTube I try to stay current with. Uh, and of course, if you want to join us on Facebook, it's my personal Facebook page, Stephen uh, Denoon, D-E-N-O-O-N. And I think some of you guys know out there, even though I write in this name, my, my legal name is Stephen Ben-Noon. It's actually the name Joshua has in the Bible, Yahshua Ben-Noon. Uh, but I write under that name because uh, the Danoon family, now my father's side converted to Christianity many years ago, but uh, many of the Danoons did not convert to Christianity. And it's always been held that, our, that we originally were Ben-Noon, and uh, they, well, they know the history of that. And the name was changed uh, to try to avoid the persecution during the, during the Spanish Inquisition. Well, my family just so happened to convert during the Inquisition. Um, but our family actually restored the name back to what we were, Benu. Uh, so that's uh, just a little tidbit of our past there. Anyway, God bless you. Baruch Hashem, uh, which is blessed is the coming, or blessed is the coming of the Lord. And uh, do everything you can. We are in a late hour, friends, very late. I don't know if it's this year, next year, what, I don't know. But it's late. And I say that more so for the Christian people. Now that you know, by the way, what the foolish virgins are, they have a relationship that's been consummated by God Almighty. He's come. He's confirmed. Let me put it this way here. You may have received Jesus Christ as your Savior. Once you do that, I believe you're set. You're okay. Stay there and stay in love with Jesus until he confirms it with an intimate relationship with you. That's when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then, anyway, God bless you. Then you're sealed to the day of your redemption.